Part 1. You will hear a new student on a short summer course getting information from the college receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> OK, here's the information you need. On the first page, there's some info about the college, the facilities, the courses on offer, etc. Uh -huh. Then, on these blue pages here, there's an outline of the social activities. You see there, OK? Yes. Now, this part of the booklet here, the yellow pages, that's the main program starting at 9am tomorrow. 9am, OK. So all the new students will be gathering in Herville Hall at nine o'clock. Uh, sorry, where? Herville Hall. I'll spell it for you. It's H-E-R-V-I-L-L. And then H-A-L-L -L for hall, of course. It's the big white building by the entrance. OK, I've seen it. Right. Anyway, you'll be in there for an hour. First, the Director of Studies will explain the various courses we offer and the requirements for them. Then for the second half hour, the social organiser will tell you more about the social programme and Saturday excursions. Is that all clear? Um, yes, I think so. Then where do I go after that? Ah, yes, OK. After the talks in the hall, there's a break. And then at quarter to 11, go to classroom four to have a placement test. Quarter to 11. This placement test is to find my level in English? Exactly. Then, after the test, all the new students are invited to a special welcome lunch. In the cafeteria? No, no. Not for the welcome lunch. It's in a restaurant near the school. An Indian restaurant. Oh, OK. I don't think I've ever tried Indian food. Do you like spicy food? Uh, yes, I do. Then you'll love Indian. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So where's the Indian restaurant? Don't worry, it's really easy to find. Have you got that map I gave you? Uh, this one? Yes, that's it. See here, the main entrance to the school? Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, don't go out of there. Oh. There's a smaller entrance here, round the back. Oh yes, I see. OK, so you go out of there, past the phone box, and then turn right into this road here, the one that goes along the side of the park. Mm -hmm. You'll see a supermarket on the left, and then it's just after that on the right. Uh -huh. It's quite a big place. You can't miss it. OK. And one more thing. Is there a post office near here? Post office? Oh, yes, of course. Just the other side of the park. Go through the middle of the park and it's there by the park entrance. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Oh, there's a good cafe near here too. Very popular with the students. Just there. You go out of the main entrance into Varley Road, then turn left at the bank and it's at the end of the street. They do amazing coffee. That's great. Thanks very much. No problem. Enjoy your course. Thanks again. Bye. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list, so for you it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are Are there enough toilet facilities and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier-free so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you. Within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. OK, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organiser in their busy conference centre, organising and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at 9am, so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at 10am and then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3.30pm and after that you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this and it'll leave from outside the refectory at 8am. You'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library, and it'll run from 10.30 until 4.00. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself, what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science? This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. 
A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the Dean of Academic Affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now, some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen.、Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read, although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm, let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes. There was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy, or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers. And I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty, on pages seventy-one and seventy-two.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition, statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, if smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin, at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools. But it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, 
with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the later... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to Team Our Stream. I'm RP, and you are watching the IELTS Listening Test Channel. I'm super excited to announce that on your demand, we have started a series of writing task two and writing.